Mm -hmm. Once again, welcome to the History of LA SCIA one-on-one -on -one sessions. I'm Junior Francis. This series celebrates the SCIA rocksteady and vintage reggae scene in Southern California and beyond through insightful conversations with legend and modern day players, including those behind the scene. We want to say thank you whether you watch us on YouTube or listen to us on podcasts. Thank you, thank you, thank you abundantly. Thanks for your support. Today's guest is a veteran on the scene, singer, songwriter, producer, band leader, record label operator, and social activist, Mike Parr of Skanking Peckle. And of course, the Bruce Lee band, he's also a member of the Chinkies and Asian Man record. The man wears so many hats, we don't have enough space in this room to uh, fit all his hats. Welcome, Mike. Thanks for joining us. How are you, sir? I'm well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's a huge pleasure to have you. I've heard a lot about you over the years. This is my first time actually interacting with you on uh, what better platform. Let's start with your place of birth. Where were you born and raised? And what was it like growing up? Uh, I was born in Seoul, Korea mm -hmm. um, in 1969 and immigrated to the United States as a baby. So I have no memory of, of life in Korea. So I grew up in Northern California first in San Francisco and then eventually to San Jose where I sp I've spent predominantly my whole life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm still here at age 52. Mm -hmm. Nice, man. nice. So um, when were you first introduced to Skia? Your I first heard the word i didn't really know what ska was like maybe like 1982 83 i remember bands like madness the english beat they were on mtv but i didn't know they were ska bands i just thought they were alternative bands and it wasn't until i saw the movie dance craze it was playing at a local art house theater in san jose and <laughs> it was it was the first and only time I experienced people skanking in the aisles of a movie theater during a movie. And so I was, and being young and in high school, I joined in on the fun. And that was my, really my first time where I kind of understood what ska was. And I was really taken in by bad manners from that movie. And like the next day, I just went, went to the record store looking for bad manners records. And from that point on, I believe that was 85. I was just all in and just jumping, jumping into everything ska. So generally on ordinary, when people go to the movie, they sit like you're in. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> and uh, how old were you? Were you accompanied by a parent or you went with friends? I went with friends. Mm -hmm. uh, so I believe I was 15 at the time. Mm hmm. Right, old enough to skank. <laughs> yeah, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just right, but now you know it's called skank. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, what was it like growing up in San Jose in that that particular time? Uh, it was pretty cool because we did have a pretty big mod ska scene here in San Jose <laughs> in the eighties. Uh, there used to be a a group of mods from San Jose that would rent out uh, a veterans hall. And they would do dances. It would be called. It was called "Cool for Cats," named after the Squeeze song. And mm -hmm. great, like once or twice a month, they would rent it out, and they'd have ska bands or soul bands play, and we would just dress sh as sharp as we could and just dance all night. It was super fun. And how about your parents? Were they pleased with your uh, behavior? Um, I guess dressing different, so to speak. Because I think <laughs> mods dress differently, right? Yeah, I was wearing my dad's because my dad had a lot of his suits from the 60s still. <laughs> so it fit me perfectly. <laughs> yeah. And they were nice suits. So I looked really sharp. You're not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so your parents accepted your behavior at that time? Not that you were behaving abnormal, but not none of your, your were your parents, your peers and friends. Uh, an associates dressing the same way? Yeah, uh, the crew that I would go to the ska like dances with, we were all dressing as mods. And so I don't think my parents really knew what was going on. They just, we looked nice. So I don't think they <laughs> minded. <laughs> right. Uh, interestingly. So you have brothers and sisters? 
Yeah, one older sister, yeah. Uh -huh. Was she into ska rock steady reggae? Uh, to some degree. I think she was a fan of Madness and the specials, but she didn't, she didn't go crazy like me and become obsessive with the music. Mm -hmm. So what caused that obsession? Is it a dance, it was da dance craze after dance craze <laughs> that was it like seeing the energy of the bands performing live in that documentary and then going to so when i saw that movie most of the two-tone bands had stopped touring regularly mm -hmm. i was able to catch like <laughs> madness on the mad not mad tour in 87 and um but that was it from the original two-tone band. But we were lucky. We had a great local band called the Uptones from Berkeley, California. We're just like all these Berkeley mods. And it was, they were a great band, especially for teenagers. And then we had the Untouchables from LA and Fishbone from LA who would, who would come up. It seemed like every three months they would play in either San Francisco or Oak, Oakland. And <clears throat> I would go every time they played. And it was exhilarating especially fishbone i think that was the band that really changed things for me in a live setting seeing a band like that mm -hmm. with so much energy and also whether i realized it or not at the time it was a band that really affected me and my political path because even their slogan was very simple it was just like this fuck racism logo that they had but when you're a young kid, 16, 15, 16 years old, something like that is very memorable. It makes a lasting impression. And so from that, those early days of seeing a band like Fishbone and, and other bands like the Dead Kennedys and Seven Seconds, it really paved my way for um, my activism in music. Mm -hmm. I think when it comes to energy, you're incomparable, uh, Fishbone. They, you know, they leave a lasting experience. Uh, uh, when you see them in concert, Fishbone. Yes. They don't like no one else. Mm -hmm. So, no when one, you, like no one else, yeah. <laughs> yeah no one. I haven't seen anyone like them since. I've only seen them once in concert, unfortunately, even though they are from here in Los Angeles. Yeah, especially in the 80s, see them in like uh, 1985, 86. It was it's hard to describe. I mean, they're still great, but it's hard to yeah. compare. 50 to 60 year old men versus late teens early 20s when they were young kids mm -hmm. it was it was incredible the mm -hmm. the stuff they were doing live it was it's hard to describe because i've never experienced that again from a band mm -hmm. yeah I'm, I'm stuck with that one word incomparable <laughs> yeah when it comes to life yes sir so at what age and at what point in your life did you pick up your first um instrument and started singing so I played piano as a young child, and then I started playing saxophone in the sixth grade. Mm -hmm. So from the age of 11, and I played sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth, and I only played four years. And then after a year off from playing, some friends wanted to start a ska band. And because I was the only one who they knew who played horn and that was into the music, I, I became the saxophone player. And I was very bad actually i still am bad today but i was really bad back then but it was just fun it was very honest mm -hmm. uh and just it's hard though everybody who's been in a band those first practices when you're a kid it's so much fun whether you're horrible mm -hmm. or you're or you're actually an amazing band being that young it's still it's just so much fun mm -hmm. right interestingly so much fun, yes, sir. Uh, your earliest experience with uh, Scafam, uh, I suppose, Jamaica, when was your first time seeing a uh, uh, live band from Jamaica? So I saw the... So the word, well, you, you're close to Frisco, so you could go across and catch live action, right? Scatolites. Yeah. So Scatolites, we, there was, the Scatolites were going to open up for the Whalers, in 1986 and we had bought tickets to see them play at the santa cruz civic but the scuttleites canceled so uh. I, I, I didn't get to see them at that show but then i saw them 
1989, they played a jazz center in uh, Santa Cruz called the Kumba Jazz Center. And that was my first time. And that was Tommy McCook was there. Roland was there. Yes. Uh, Lloyd Nibs, Lloyd Brevet were the four of the original members that were there. Jackie Mitu wasn't? No. Oh, you, Jackie. What year was that? 19... 1989. No, no. Sorry. Nine... When was that? That was... Uh... I'm trying to know. Trying... <laughs> right. 89 or 90? 89 or 90? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so by then, no, Jackie, Jackie was out to the band? No, no, Jackie. There was a white guy playing keyboards, I remember. And he looked like a, like a hired jazz musician. And he seemed very bored because it was just... Ding, <laughs> ding, ding, ding. You, you, missed, <laughs> you, you missed Jackie. <laughs> He's irreplaceable. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yes, sir. What was your first Kia album you ever purchased? A lot of memory uh, juggling here, Mike. <laughs> it, was, it was Bad Manners Class with a K. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's not even Buster Blood Vessel on the cover. It's another large man. It, I never understood that's not even Buster. <clears throat> and it's like he's at the head of a table and there's just like a smorgasbord going on. That's the first Sky album I ever bought. Uh, you're still buying or are you uh, Sky? I am not buying. I'm so, I sold most. You know, of my records. Collection. You know, records are coming back in a huge way, a big way. Oh yeah, records I've been, I've been selling selling my collection over the last ten years, and uh, I still all my signed records I still have. So all the two tone records, all of the the classics I still have. Um, a lot of the like I have uh, a lot of the Studio One stuff. I have like Skylights records. Original pressings, 45s or albums, 12 inches. I have uh, like a, a Desmond Decker 12 inch. I know I have a G couple Jackie Matu records. Um, uh, Don Drummond, I know I have a Don Drummond record. Um, so, uh, I, that time of my life in when I was in high school, it was such a pure and honest experience going to the record stores. I, I had so much fun. I don't have that fun anymore. I'm going that, to was, that was, the, that was the, yeah, before corruption. <laughs> the well, I, could sit in, <laughs> I could spend all day, like I would make a trip to Los Angeles and I could spend, you know, 10 hours just going to every record store. And it was the most fun finding these great, like old soul skinhead reggae records. And I don't, I don't do that anymore. I just can't. I don't have the capacity to, to go record shopping like I did once upon a time. Yes, uh, of course not. Of course not. Mm -hmm. So now let's talk about uh, the formation of uh, Skanking Pickle. Uh, sure. Who were the biggest influence and uh, also the core members of the band? So sort of, sort of a two-part question. Formation yeah. and the core members. Yeah, so that band, uh, we started in 19... We actually, our first practice was in 1988, and it was uh, my first year of college. So it was people I met at the junior college I was going to, and uh, the drummer, he was just a rock drummer. He doesn't even know what ska was. The, the bass player was a big Fishbone fan, and that's where we bonded was over Fishbone. And from there, I knew people from high school who were in, grew up in the ska scene, so I recruited them. Uh, on guitar and trombone and it was really I, I mean I'll be honest it was really us trying to be fishbone it was a really like a ripoff like that's all we we were so influenced by the band mm -hmm. we knew we would never be that good but it was something to strive for it's like mm -hmm. let's be as crazy as fishbone or let's see if we can have that that kind of energy we would try to practice when we practice we would try to go crazy during practice to like build up our endurance so it was it was very much influenced by fishbone uh and the two-tone bands uh the specials in particular um but we we definitely mixed in different styles and that's predominantly because we were a demo a, a democracy as a band so if i had my say i think we would have been strictly ska and reggae but we had other members who liked to play like <laughs> funk and that's kind of the, the parts of the band I, I wasn't so fond of, but 
and that's that's just the way it is when you're in a yes a democracy you know in, instead of saying rip off professor reggae people like to say barred extensively see he has yeah. really wonderful vocabulary <laughs> but i mean just about everyone borrowed from someone else right at some point or sure. Mm -hmm. sure but i think it was blatant and not maybe the sound not so much but the attitude the oh, attitude right. and the energy is what we really wanted to mm -hmm. um take from fishbone from the experience of seeing fishbone right and from there on, they are, well, the core members before my next question, the core members. So the core members was myself, mm -hmm. uh, Lars Nylander on valve trombone, Jerry Lundquist on slide, uh, Lynette, Lynette Naxted on guitar, Chuck Phelps on drums, and Mike Mattingly on bass. And that was the band for the whole dur duration. It was the same band, except for the bass player switched out a couple of times, but everyone else was the same. And you guys uh, used to work like a firefly, toured extensively um, until I get for about eight years, if my- Yeah, we, we it was uh, seven years. Seven From years. 89 oh, to 96. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And why you guys stopped in after eight years? Uh, I just, I couldn't take it anymore. I was really burnt out. I had lost the joy of touring. I was very, fake on stage like a, a really fake smile of hey this is thank you everybody we're having such a you're such a great audience but the but truth they was, were but weren't the audience great they, they were but it was fake for me because i didn't care and when i knew in my heart like why am i just doing this i'm a fraud and i i just called myself out and i said you got to stop this is uh this is not fair for anybody it's not fair for yourself it's not fair for the crowd and I just, I just didn't want to do it anymore. So we stopped. <laughs> uh, so you use the word fraud. So I'm not sure where's the unrealness. I mean, it's better work in the office. Because the, 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 work. the fraud part is me pretending everything is okay on stage. So if I'm on stage and I'm telling the crowd, this is wonderful. But in my mind, I'm thinking, I can't do this. My anxiety, my mental health was declining. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And so the, the years of touring, being in a van and just yes. losing my mind year after year, it just kept growing and growing. Mm -hmm. And so I knew I had to stop. Mm -hmm. Understandable. Yeah. Understandable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was the California uh, scene like uh, at that time? It was, it was pretty cool. Uh, we were not very liked by, especially by the LA scene. So the <laughs> LA scene did not like Skank and Pickle. So when we first started coming to LA in the early nineties, even though like a band like No Doubt and Fishbone had paved the way for like um, music crossing over and playing different genres, a lot of the shows we were playing were strictly with on ska bills and the ska purists, especially in the early nineties did not like skank and pickle at all. So we would have to just <clears throat> tough it out. We'd play our set, you know, there'd be some people like this, but a lot of those, a lot of the mods and rude boys and skinheads did not like skank and pickle mm -hmm. and anyone, any older person from that generation from Los Angeles, they could they will testify on my behalf mm -hmm. to, of that being the truth <laughs> yeah I, I i i sense some of that too even though I, I arrive on the scene slightly later so what are some of the highlights the band highlights during those years especially the fun years before burning so meeting meeting all the friends like they're just becoming friends with bands like let's go bowling and getting to tour with your idols like <clears throat> bad manners and then when the special beat first came and getting to play with them mm -hmm. uh, three nights and smoking weed with Rankin and roger and dave wakeling it was as a young kid it was like this is incredible <laughs> it's like i can't believe this is happening uh just being able to tour it's in lieu of college i toured so i dropped out of school at age 19 
and just started touring full time, being able to play all over the world uh, and just get to really see see the world in a, in a different way that most people can uh, can uh, see the world. And that's on a poverty level almost where we were not a big band. We were making so little money. I was getting paid five dollars a day. We would sleep on strangers' floors every night all across the United States, some homes better than others. We stayed in some rancid filth homes filled with cat urine and cat feces, like anything you can imagine we experienced during that duration of, of touring. Um, but at the same time, the <clears throat> people who would let you stay at their home, even though we, we had never met them, we would just ask people from, from the stage, can we stay at your home? Can anyone <laughs> let us stay at your home? <laughs> I needed this love. <laughs> so we would we would Whoa. meet a lot of great. But that's people. creative, though. That's extremely creative. We couldn't afford you knew, it. But you knew there would be no harm because they were fans. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the only people who let you stay, let strangers stay at their homes, are kind, nice people. So we met some of the nicest people, mm -hmm. friends that I still keep in touch with to this day. Of course, because of course, of course. because they were just so so kind. Wow. to a bunch of strangers mm -hmm. so uh your parents how did they accept the fact that you drop out of school well they didn't like it at all of course not that's why i asked <laughs> it was it took a while it was after skank and pickle it wasn't until the success of asian man records that they were able to accept it it's strange because somehow korean media had picked up on my story and so the Korean television station in San Francisco came to my parents' home to interview me and my family. And then the newspaper came to and wrote a story. And older generation Koreans, they like to brag about their children. And so their friends had seen the story on TV and they were calling them saying, oh, we saw, we saw you on TV. And suddenly it became okay yes. that their son was this Understand. musician. Very strange, but that was that was a turning point. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But still no money up to that point. <laughs> it was starting to come in at that point. Oh, when, okay. I, when I started mm -hmm. doing Asian Man Records, mm -hmm. I, I had a really good knack of the music business. Right. And, that, and that's why I wanted to do it. And uh, so I was starting to make money mm -hmm. uh, at the end of 1996. Mm -hmm. Which is my next question, the formation of Asian Man's Record, how that idea sure. came about. Well, we had already we had already started our own record label with Skank and Pickle as a collective, and we called it mm -hmm. Dill Records. And it was owned by all the members of the band, but in reality, I was doing all the work. So I knew in the long run, you can't have you can't have six cooks in the kitchen. And so I said, I need to just do my own thing. And that's when I left and started Asian Man. Uh, because I, I, I knew there was going to be issues moving forward as the label was getting more popular. So that's why I started Age Man. I just wanted it to be strictly mine, my decisions only. And uh, that's, that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's some of the acts that you release albums for? Sure. So the first album we released was Less Than Jake from Gainesville, Florida. We released their first full length record. And then we released the second record was a, a band from Chicago called Slapstick. Both were in the ska punk genre and both were very, very good bands, very young bands. And they were, it was the perfect storm. Both bands were blowing up at the same time in this underground. And it all just came together at the perfect time for me where all these years of making no money it was I was starting to see this the light of day and, and saw some profits coming in mm -hmm. so was it by choice that you signed bands from other town yeah well it was because the gift of touring with skank and pickle was i was able to meet all these bands You're right so in able to write so you were opening a, a huge network nationwide yeah. perhaps yeah. you guys toured abroad as well uh Skank and Pickle did not tour abroad. Unfortunately. So it was, it was just uh, Canada. Coast Mexico. to coast. Yeah. Coast to coast. 
but that's how I met Les and Jake. They opened up for the band in Florida, and that's how I met Slapstick. Mm -hmm. They opened up for the band in um, Chicago, and then that's how I met MU330. They opened up for us in St. Louis. It was just a, a great way to meet fantastic bands and, mm -hmm. and really nice people, too. And of course, they were comfortable having their records on your label, even though the label was relatively new at the time. Yeah, were, I, th I think they just, because we had become friends, yes. they felt comfortable because of that friendship we had developed mm -hmm. at, the, at the same time. So it, it was, a, I think, a win-win situation for everybody at the, at the time. You're not kidding, sir. So talk about um, the formation of Bruce Lee and the Chinkies. Sure. Uh, the biggest difference between uh, those groups. So the Bruce Lee band was strictly supposed to be a side project. So during Skank and Pickle, I had always been a prolific songwriter. So I had a, a surplus of songs that weren't going to make it on a Skank and Pickle record. So I asked the members of Lesson Jake if they would be the backing band for just a side project called the Bruce Lee band. Nothing, nothing more than that in my mind. It was just going to be a fun project. So I flew to Florida, recorded, like, I think we did two days, recorded that record, and it was done. We played, I think, five shows. That was it. And I didn't think anything of it after that. Just like side project, fun little project. And then 10 years later, I did another record with the members of RX Bandits, who are a great band from Southern California. And then 10 years after that, <laughs> I thought, let's do another one. And that's when I met up with uh, <clears throat> Jeff Rosenstock, who's a friend of mine and a great musician. And when we got together and started recording, that's when we had such a connection. And we decided, let's just keep this core lineup um, moving forward. And since I teamed up with Jeff, we've done one, two, three, three EPs and two full lengths. So it's it's been a really kind of fruitful um, meeting of minds with, with Jeff as a producer. I'd never worked with a producer before. So uh, in addition to him being a, uh, a member, he's also produced all the records. Mm -hmm. And um, um, the, yeah, the Chinkies, is that a, 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 a well, sure. my thought. Yeah, so, so the Chinkies, we actually, but it's not a negative connotation. It is. And we had used that on part of a word play, right? You play with words. Yeah, because so we're we were all Asian Americans. Oh, and, we, it, oh, ah. and we wanted to, it was kind of the same way NWA was using their name as a mm -hmm. a way to feel uncomfortable. We wanted people to feel uncomfortable looking at that name or saying the name. Uh the chinkies it's a racist term in the united states so why is that we wanted people to look at it and go why is this a racist term and let the music kind of guide you through some of the experiences we as asian americans have gone through in our life and so and going of, through. yeah and so a lot of the songs that we wrote for these records i think we, we released three full lengths and uh a couple EPs and it's it's very overtly um, political music and it, it had just had to do a lot of with um, growing up as Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. So why is it important for you to take a stand and you know speak out on behalf of those who are voiceless? I think going back to like Fishbone seeing that that logo that fuck racism logo and seeing how much that affected me, knowing that music for me at least, and I would think a lot of people can agree that it moves you in ways that nothing else can move you. So why not use this great gift to influence people for the better? Mm -hmm. Instead of being a capitalist machine, just grinding away for numbers, dollar signs, uh, status, it, it seems very uh, counterproductive if that's all I'm trying to get in life versus can I make this, can I make Asian Man Records more than just a faceless uh, corporation? 
can I put my ideas behind this label with a stamp of approval so people know that the music that they're getting is always based in the idea of anti-racism, anti-sexism. And it doesn't mean every band I release is political. I mean, I and I love fun bands. I love silly bands, like, like a band like the Aquabats. You know, I, I love it. Kids having fun and just music is meant to be fun too. So there's nothing wrong with bands that are, are having a good time. It was just in, in this case with the Chinkies in particular, I wanted it to be more than just music. Mm -hmm. As, as I've always said, that there's always room for bubblegum music. You can't be always get up, stand up, stand up for your right. Sure. <laughs> so, which leads into us. So, I want to do some memory juggling, take you back to 1998. Why is it important for you to speak out about injustice um, um, on music as opposed to doing it in writing? So, we're talking in particular about the Scoggins Racism Tour of 1998. Yeah, 1998. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at the time in popular music, there had just been a renaissance with the, the second Woodstock, which was infiltrated by rapes, by destruction, by this. Those are bands or um, people with I, uh, who hold those ideas? Well, it, it came from, you know, I don't, I wouldn't say no, bands specifically or say, rape and destruction. Those were the names of bands? No, that was happening in the audience what do you mean people audience? people so it, during the woodstock the second woodstock women were being raped probably when the bands were, are playing yeah oh uh property was getting uh destroyed and the mentality of the bands i felt were not that of what the original woodstock was which was this idea of peace through music so kind of the opposite, I would say. Mm. Uh, and so I wanted to do something. I couldn't just do a tour that right. had no substance behind it. And also at the time, I felt like Scott, Scott comes from a political background. But with the emergence of the popularity of the music in the United States in the 90s, it had become carnivalized, I felt. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was I was to blame too. I was in a band called Skank and Pickle that was very silly and nutty, and so I'm like I'm part of the, part to blame in this this view of ska on a global spectrum, at least in the United States. So what can I do? And I felt like let's do a tour where we can try to teach about the original idea of two tone of black and white coexisting and to have kids have something to think about other than just going crazy at a show. How can we have tables, like we could have literature for kids, we could have um, uh, pamphlets, uh, merchandise, so kids can buy a shirt that says anti-racist and wear it at their school for other kids to see. Um, that was a couple of the reasons why I wanted to do the Ska Against Racism tour in 1998. Mm -hmm. And this is not just fake news that uh, women were being raped. Um, no, it's it's it was very it was very common knowledge if you research. And there's some documentaries on YouTube just mm -hmm. of the the shit show that was happening at Woodstock. Um, so it was it was really that the bands like it was an aggressive style of music that was very popular like bands like Limp Bizkit and Korn, Rage Against the Machine. It was that, that, that fuck shit up kind of groove. Not saying that the bands were advocating for that, but I don't think any of the bands were trying to, if they were aware of it, no one said anything to make it stop. So yeah, something that was bothersome for hmm. me. Right, and how extensive was that tour? It was, it was a long tour. Uh, I think it was like forty-five shows. Wow, across country, coast to coast. Yeah, across, across, across the country, right? And where some of the places you stopped? Like everywhere you can imagine. Every every major city we hit. So it'd be like L.A., San Francisco, Seattle, Portland, New York, Salt Lake City, Denver. Um, 
you name it, St. Louis, Chicago, Miami. Uh, Were you met with any rejection anywhere? No. Mm -hmm. All love and warmth. Yes. And, you know, in a lot of ways, I felt like we were preaching to the choir. So in retrospect, I think like how much good did it really do? Mm. But at the same time, I've, I've heard from so many adults now who were kids back then who said, who've told me how much it meant to them when oh. they were young, growing up, mm -hmm. going to those shows. So it gives me some hope that mm. it did do some good. And Oh, a lot so, of good. Yeah. I'd love to do something like that again, but it, it's hard at so my what, age. <laughs> uh, besides age, what would it take to orchestrate a tour like that? It would take a, a bigger band willing to be the anchor, willing to bypass a little bit of money so they can help donate it to charity mm -hmm. and to be all in on the mission statement. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want bands doing it because, for clout. I don't want bands doing it to help them rise a couple steps on the ladder. I want people who are all in on, on what we are trying to do. That's going to be a challenge, more than a challenge, because everybody wants to rise though. But what's bad about rising? There's nothing. But if the, I don't want them to use a political platform mm -hmm. to try to rise up on that ladder. This is not the time to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Let's uh, step back again. Uh, let's talk about uh, the latest album from the Bruce Lee band. Why did you decide to reform when you did? Okay, so so this record we put out a couple have months it, ago. Can you show it to the um, audience? Oh, I don't have it here with me. <laughs> oh. Superimpose it right here. That's the whole idea, sir. <laughs> Generate so, some interest. Yeah. So uh, it's called One Step Forward, Two Steps Back. And this this is the part of the Jeff Rosenstock lineup, and we've been pretty active for the last um, five, six years uh, mm -hmm. putting out records. So this is, we had just put out a seventh song. Well, oh, trying to remember now. I think it went like, it went EP, full length, seven song EP, five song EP, and then this full length came out. Uh, it's an extension of just kind of the anger I felt. I've used music as therapy. Uh, I don't tour a lot anymore. I have a lot of mental health issues that um, don't allow me to tour anymore. Mm. But I, 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 use, I use music for therapy and it's, uh, it's a way for me to get ideas off my chest mm. and to share it through music. So if you listen to the record, you listen to the lyrics, it's a lot of, it's an angry record. I'm, I'm pissed off. It's... Uh, I wish it was more uplifting. There are there are points of um, positivity in the record. I don't want it to be all negative, but uh, I, yeah, I'm pretty angry on this record, and I, I feel like it shows in the lyrics. And angry about anything in particular? Just just the the fact that we are such a divided country. Mm -hmm. Just it's a it's become like a sporting event. You're either on the left or you're on the right. Whose team is winning? It doesn't matter what it takes. But if your team is winning, it's all cheers and applause. Mm -hmm. Why is that? If we're talking about like, if we're talking about the United States as a people, shouldn't it be united instead of divided? But is that practical to have unity? Well, probably not, but oh, if oh, all right. And was there ever unity in this country? No. Oh, okay. So Absolutely I, not. Okay. okay. But saying. if you don't have anything, if you don't have hope, what is there to live for? But I'm not sure if there's any relationship between hope and unity. Hope for me. Because people on the left have hope, people on the right have hope. And yeah. people in the middle also, I suppose, have hope. Ho hope for me is is viewed like as follows. Mm -hmm. I know where I stand politically. Mm -hmm. I know where I stand as a father. I know where I stand as a husband, as a son. Where I stand with people who have a different thought than myself, I won't put myself at a level where I'll say, 
fuck that person strictly because they have a different thought. If they're openly fascist, mm -hmm. of course I will denounce that. But because someone has a differing thought than me, I'm not automatically going to say this person should, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna denounce this person because I feel like through conversation, maybe I can change this person's idea of what I think is right. Or maybe they'll try to explain to me why they think I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. But without conversation, or without the willingness to converse, it's just running on a treadmill. And it's, that's why the record's called One Step Forward, Two Steps Back. Because anytime we try to make that progress, we're always being pushed back. By who? That's the thing. <laughs> who is pushing us back? So it's not clear who is pushing us back? Well, there's a lot of variables in who's pushing us back. It's corporate. It's, it's greed. It's money. Money is pushing us back. Yeah. Religion is pushing us back. It's a driving force. Money. Yeah, money. Money, is, money drives everything. Money this is changes true. everything. Sure. Politics pushes us back. And I think the, the, the unwillingness to accept something that's different. Mm -hmm. And older generation pushes us back. You can't, the, the idea of you can't teach an old dog new tricks is true in 99% of the cases. Mm -hmm. What do you do with your grandfather who is a staunch Republican and has racist overtones? You don't agree with them well if he does not have inheritance you cut ties uh -huh. with him. if he has inheritance <laughs> and you stick around to inherit <laughs> that's, that's a good point oh, I've, I've already studied this 20 years of studying yeah, this. Yeah. Sure, he sure. has inheritance you stick around and be nice guy <laughs> yeah 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 you want is we call it in jamaica deadlift <laughs> that's funny because my friend it just happened to my friend he just inherited <laughs> a home he just sold for like one point five million dollars. Yeah, right, just stick around and live with <laughs> indignity. <laughs> yeah, but I, I I think there's a thing for older generation. You have to, they have to die off. It's gonna be a point where everyone who is seventy plus, their window is short. What do you got? Twenty more years. But so a lot of people, people, but it seems as though those people are multiplying like mushroom, like wild mushroom, right? It's the, it does seem like a lot of younger folks are being um, pushed to extremist ideas and behavior. Uh, that's that's worrisome because I always thought that once the older gener generation died off, it would be smooth sailing. But I, I, I thought that when I first arrived here too. And, and that's not the, the civil rights movement. That time. Yeah, it's it's not the case. So, uh, yeah, it is worrisome <laughs> that that the change. <laughs> there has been a change, and I, you know, I mean, let's not mix words. I feel like it just has a lot to do with the Trump presidency and the outrageousness of people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, Ted Cruz, uh, Lauren Bo Bobert, and Holly and. DeSantis and just the list goes on to how absurd some of this shit is, at least in, in my view, mm -hmm. that you can just say whatever you want and just the big lie can be just pushed on to another, other levels. Just keep going, no matter what. Just keep lying, keep lying, keep lying until everyone believes it, or at mm -hmm. least your base believes it. Indeed. So extremely unfortunate. One more question before I introduce our producer. So we, we really drifted into politics. Is that, that, that's another subject, politics. We can spend the all night talking about politics. But I also wanted to, um, the album that uh, with Bruce Lee, this side, uh, the album that you just put out, you were talking about, unfortunately, unhappily, you don't have uh, the jacket to show. So I want to talk about some of the guest performers. Sure. From yes. Los Angeles, we have um, a household name, Angela Moore of Fishbone, and Jeremy from Skatoon New Network. Angelo is my, he's like my hero. That's my hero, but uh, also my friend. We've been friends now for 
probably over 30 years. So it wasn't hard just, getting him as a guest? Yeah, I just asked him, he said yes, and remarkably, <laughs> he was be my guest. He, he did it pretty quickly. I, I, I couldn't oh, believe it. He's a genius. He is a genius. Mm -hmm. He is a genius. And then I asked him to be in the video. And so he was, I said, just dance in the video. And he was hurt too. He had a, he had a partially torn Achilles mm. and he still did it. And he was listening back to the music and he said, is that me playing? I'm like, yeah, that's you. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't even know. <laughs> I love him. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeremy, another... Uh, Equally spectacular. Give him props. Yes. And um, someone I don't know as well as Angelo, but someone I have huge respect for and someone who's doing great things. Mm -hmm. and, um, and let's say his last name. Hunter. Jeremy. Yes, sir. Oh, the respect. Jeremy Hunter. Mm -hmm. I believe Jeremy lives in Gainesville, Florida. Mm -hmm. I could be. I know in Florida, but uh, I, I can't remember what city. And Jeremy's played on the last two records, the mm -hmm. full record. So Jeremy plays on the entire record, every track. Mm -hmm. So I feel like Jeremy is basically uh, a member of the Bruce Lee band. Mm -hmm. Right. Interesting. So I think I'm going to introduce uh, a good friend and our producer, Eric Kohler. It's time to touch the microphone. Hello, Mike. Hi. Great to meet you finally. Um, you know, we I've seen you with Skank and Pickle back in the day on two occasions. Once, I think, in Orange County and once out in Riverside, maybe the barn or somewhere out there in the Inland Empire. And, Before uh, I knew you? uh yeah maybe right before we met or around mm -hmm. that time um and simply incredible live performance high energy um everything everything uh you're talking about being influenced by fishbone not surprising <laughs> um but it's a pleasure to have you here with us today and uh, really appreciate your time and, and and junior you were just mentioning jeremy as a guest obviously mike on your um, bruce lee band album and Junior, you were raving about Jeremy because Jeremy played uh, on the Slacker show recently in downtown LA. That was a trombonist. Was I there? Seeing the Slackers. Oh, that, that's him. That's a trombonist. Oh, yeah. Did, did, his, bring it up, bring it up. Bring yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> I just need to remind Junior because yeah. Junior, Junior, Junior went to that show where We Are the Union was one of the opening bands for the Slackers. And he was mm -hmm. raving about the trombonist. And I said, Yeah, that's Jeremy. Yeah. Resurrection. <laughs> that's so that's who that okay. is okay yeah um mike i wanted to point out before i get to a couple of questions i was i took my daughter several years ago to the shrine for yo gabba gabba yes and, and and all of a sudden at some point during the sets um feel like jumping comes on marcy griffiths right famous too. Yeah. and here out comes mike park here out comes uh, Matt Skiba of, of, of Alkaline Trio and, and, and uh, mm. Blink-182. And you guys, I have a video clip of it. You guys, it was so great. And watching my daughter dance around to that song uh, and seeing you guys up there was super cool. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, did you do that? Did you do um, a number of those Yo Gabba Gabba shows or was that just a one-off uh, little appearance? I did three months. <laughs> oh, you did? So, so did you go on the tour? Yeah, I did the whole tour. And so each city, they let me, if I knew people, I would just invite them to come up. And it was easy. I just said, just sing the back, just sing the la 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 la's. And the, <laughs> so it was really easy and fun to be able to like invite friends in each city. Who, who, who were some of the other um, uh, singers that came up there with you? Uh, we had uh, Lita, the professional wrestler like oh, WWF yeah. Oh, yeah. Hall of Famer. Yeah. Uh, I had Jay from the Suicide Machines. I had uh, Rob and Jerry from MU330. Uh, Brendan from Slapstick, Lawrence Arms. Uh, Dan from Alkaline Trio did the Florida okay. show. Wow. Uh, I would just even in markets that if, if I just knew the people, I would just make up bands. Like, let's say it was you let's say you lived in salt lake and i had right. you come up i would just say you're somebody from modest mouse or something i was just making up <laughs> <That's> people <great. laughs> 
<laughs> just having fun with it. But I always try to try to get people to come and yeah. join me on stage every night. Yeah. Oh, that's that's super fun and creative. Um, and so, what are your thoughts with the uh, soon to be revived Yo Gabba Gabba for Apple uh, TV? I'm just hoping they invite me to go on tour again. <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice yeah. yeah so you haven't given up touring well that kind of touring i will do because oh, okay. it's like the most luxurious tour you can imagine remember i played one song a day i played five minutes a day and the rest of the time i was in a tour bus i had my own dressing room and i had my own hotel room every night it so was luxury. It was ridiculous. Wow. So it wasn't, it never felt like work. I felt like I was on a paid vacation. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and sticking with with the youth and and, and children, um, talk about your your new children's album, Coloring Book Smile. That's actually probably over 10 years old now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, but 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 talk about it because I know you've dabbled, um, you've dabbled in other and you've released other children's music. Um I think even Jesse Wagner of Agrilites um, uh, did did some, uh, but 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 talk about talk about why that's important to you, and talk about specifically Smile. So my daughter was born in two thousand six, and I just found myself strumming the guitar when she cried. Just you try anything when your kid is crying. Yeah. And same with my son when he was born, and as they were, got a little bit older. Where they could understand words i just kind of improvise stuff and some stuff they would just laugh hysterically and i thought why don't i release a children's record and so that's started me down that path okay and i thought well gosh why don't i start a children's record label and so <laughs> i started fun fun records and the idea was to release music by people in the punk and ska community that had kids. I think we actually ended up mostly with people who didn't have kids <laughs> right. putting, putting out records. But then as my kids got older, now they're almost 14 and 16, I've totally lost interest in it. They're yeah. not kids anymore. We don't right. do that. I was just kids. about to have my son. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I need to right. Yeah, it's meant for consideration. Um, so 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 fun fun, which was like an imprint of Asian man yeah. is, is not really active. No, but I, it's certain, like if, I mean, if Jesse Wagner asked me to do another record, I'd probably do it because yeah, he's just such a talented musician sure, and he wrote, sure. he wrote yeah. such a killer children's record. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I really, really enjoyed that one as well. Um, what are, what are some of the biggest misconceptions about the quote third wave sky scene in your opinion i uh, and, and, I, do even, and do you even like the term third wave sky i just think it's it's hard when everything anything gets to become popular even the sky has been going on for decades the rise the meteoric rise of ska in the mainstream in the mid to late 90s was pretty drastic and what that what that causes in in any kind of music even when green day blew up mm -hmm. you have every kid trying to to start a band in that genre so you had every high school in america so just imagine thousands of high schools all over america every high school having five different ska bands and all of them being horrible because A, they just didn't know how to play ska. B, they didn't know how to play ska. <laughs> C. C, they, they just didn't understand didn't know what ska was. Right. There's, they right. didn't understand the history of, of, of where the music came from. Yeah. So, and then, and then they might have thought, let's just put in some horns and it's ska. Yeah. And bless their hearts. They're just kids. They're having fun. But sure. when I was at my tail end of my touring in the 90s, it was rough. Like some of the bands that played with us, it was just like, I, I just couldn't believe how bad some of these bands were. 
But at the same time, I would try to be positive because I always feel like anytime someone is playing music, it's just such a great thing uh, and you should be supportive. But at the same time, I was, I was, uh, I have an hard time <laughs> watching so many bad bands and not just like once in a while, every single night, it seemed like there'd be three opening bands. <laughs> yeah. Two, yeah. Two and a half would be just, two and a half of the bands would just be horrible. And And during that time, in the late 90s, you were primarily touring with, was it the Chinkies or Bruce Lee band? Uh, so in the late 90s, I did, I stopped touring in 96. Right. I did, a, I did Ska Against Racism with the Bruce Lee band in 98. Right. Okay. That's pretty much it for, for Ska tours. The Chinkies did like five shows. Okay. Ever, ever in the United yeah. States. And that's it. We did some stuff abroad in Europe and, and Japan, but that's it. I've done some, I did, I've done some solo stuff, just acoustic guitar. Um, but I haven't done much touring in the last 20 years. So, so, but speaking of touring, so which band was it and, and what was the response and what was your feeling when you finally got to play Korea? That was Bruce Lee band okay. and it was, a, it was a home run. That was a lot of trust. You had to go in, just go on, we're either going to get completely ripped off or we got to trust them. And I took the gamble and said, we're going to trust them. We had to pay you mean, for our... Meaning you're talking about the promoter? Yeah. We had to pay for our tickets in advance ourselves, and they were going to reimburse us in Korea. Like that, not a good move, not a smart business decision on my end, but I went for it. And it was, I got, everything was reimbursed. It was the biggest show I ever played in my life. Wow. And it was just a special, a special feeling. I remember. Was, was, it, a, was it a festival or a headline? A festival. Okay. And just getting off stage and look, Dan Potes from MU330, he played guitar. And I remember it's like, it was an outdoor show and just us sitting backstage and kind of looking at each other, just going, wow, without even saying anything, just kind of like, yeah. that's something we've never done before. It was pretty special. So far surpassed your expectations and, and, your, and your dreams there. Yeah, it was really cool. And it was on, it was on TV in Korea too. So we got to see it on tv later so that was kind of neat yeah absolutely yeah. um do you have family over there i do aunts uncles lots of cousins those homecoming <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> unfortunately that show was in pusan so it was quite a distance from seoul where everybody lives okay okay yeah. and did you tour any other asian countries uh i've done japan uh quite a bit i think like 13 times now um oh, okay wow. and uh great great scene there too yeah. very knowledgeable like the, they can very di differentiate like the different styles of ska yeah. they have like a very like blue beat trad ska scene yeah they have a ska punk scene it's it's interesting yeah they, how knowledgeable they are there's a number of pretty incredible uh uh, Japanese ska bands. I've, I've over here. I've seen a couple times Tokyo Ska Paradise Orchestra, uh, sure. uh, or ska, uh, or ska's or ska band. Right, that, that's another a ska band. Yeah, that's another okay. big one. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, who do you? Who are some of the more underrated ska bands in your opinion that don't get the due respect that maybe people who who might not have given a chance should. Well, I think of that that third wave, the quote unquote third wave, MU330 was the band that should have been bigger than everybody else. Which, which one? It, MU330. M MU330. Yeah. Their songs are just way more craftily, craftily, is that a word? Craftily <laughs> written yep. versus the bands that got that mainstream um, uh hit the hits in the mainstream so i always felt like mu330 should have been a band and a band like slow gherkin too i thought could have been a very big band too yeah yeah uh, and you know for this new wave of bands there's i feel like there's so many good bands but the band i really like is that band cat Bite from philadelphia oh yeah yeah and great I, great soulful type singer and um yeah you know, i'm also a big fan i've not had a chance to see them live i don't know if they've if they, they haven't played, here, they've, they've not. not. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. But yeah. yeah, I was able to collaborate with the singer 
oh. uh, last year we did a song together um and that was really cool unlike one of those um uh video type recordings uh or, or are you saying is it a song I, I, release it's a yeah it's called uh i feel like <laughs> what's the song called? something about quicksand if you look mike oh, Park, okay. quicksand yeah 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 I, I think i do know what you're talking about now but i will i will check that out yeah um and then um when, when you and Junior were talking about the Ska Against Racism tour, uh, I think we'd be remiss not, not for you to talk about some of the bands that were part of that tour. Sure. It was uh, The Toasters, Less and Jake, ME330, The Blue Meanies, Mustard Plug, Five Iron Frenzy, Kamuri, myself. Did I say Blue Meanies? Blue you Meanies? Did. You did, yep. I think that's it. I hope I'm not missing anybody. There's a lot of freaking bands. And was it, was it, um, did you play outdoors, indoors, combination of? Combination, yeah. Okay. Mostly indoors. Right. Yeah. And I mean, schlepping across the country and playing, um, because that was also during a time where there were, I mean, Warp Tour was out there, right? I mean, there were, um, there were, there were a lot of, there were a lot of, uh, I'm sure, uh, tours out there happening, right? So, I mean... Uh, yeah, specials were touring at the same time, too. Oh, they were? Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, how do you keep... So, what inspires you and how do you keep the flames burning to where you've kept, you've kept Asia Men records going over these years? You, you continue, obviously, to play music, write music, record... Uh, maybe not tour as much, but but what, what keeps what keeps you going, Mike? I don't know. <laughs> it's it's something I enjoy. Obviously, I wouldn't do it if it wasn't something I I loved. I like making music, um, and I do like performing. I just have a really strange relationship with performing because I because of my past experience of going through the motions. I never I told myself never to do that again. And so every time I do play, I put so much into it emotionally yeah. that it can be very draining on me. Right. And that's why I don't do it a lot. At least when I'm fronting, when I'm the main uh, uh, front man in the project, that's when it's very hard. If I'm just playing guitar for somebody, I, I can do that all day. <laughs> that's no problem because I could just sure. hide in the back and dance yeah. around. Well, and on that front, have you have you made guest appearances like that where you play guitar or you play sax yeah. or thing? Uh, who are some of the bands that you've worked with over the years? You've made so, yeah, I so I have a I have a band in San Jose called Kitty Cat Fan Club. It's not a ska band. It's just like an indie pop band. and I just play guitar. So it's just a fun band. It's, it's really enjoyable because I don't have to do anything except play guitar uh -huh. and sing some background vocals. Nice. But yeah. I'm not the, I'm not the focus at all. So there's no, I don't have any stress. I don't if there's nobody at the show, I don't care. Right. Like, oh, this is this is great. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Just having fun. <laughs> but um, but what what about some other bands that you have made a guest appearance on as far as albums or recordings? Have there been others? Um, there's got to be. I feel like I've done so much stuff. I do one of my done lately. And you have. And you have. What have I done lately? I can't even think. Do you okay. have a list in front of you that you're ready no, to no, no, I, I don't. Oh. It's, it's all right. It's all right. But we can, we can. I, I'm sure. I'm sure you have as well. Um, the I just sang on the Abrupters' new album coming out. Oh, nice. Okay. So I know I did sing on that. I did. Uh, I do. I have another project called Ogi Kubo Station that I. Okay. Play guitar and write songs, but that's very, very indie rocky type of stuff. Um, but I, God, I feel like I'm. Always, I, I just played saxophone for a band called Gladdy. It's an okay. indie rock band from Philadelphia. Nice. Uh, what else? I played on the Ska Dream, that Rosenstock Ska Dream yep. Yep. record. I played sax on that. I'm sure I'm missing. Usually, when people ask me to do stuff, I just say okay. Sure. <laughs> That's good. Um, but but so but going back to Asia Man, so 
since since Asia Man's been in existence since 90, 96. 90, 96, you've seen recorded music and and the way that re- music is consumed change so much, right? Right. So so when you started, it was CDs, right? Um, maybe some vinyl. Then obviously there was the whole digital and and downloads and maybe people buying less. And then obviously albums coming vinyl coming back. But um, but how how have you how have you managed to to stay afloat? And do you do this all? Do you have office? Do you do this from your garage? Do you do? Yeah. So I've always done this. Overall. Yeah, I've always done this at my mom's garage. Wow. Uh, so we started in 96 and I have felt like I had a good jump on when the music business changed where other labels were still spending and still doing the music conferences, whether it was like South by Southwest or CMJ when it existed, existed or Midham in Germany, they're spending so much money and I just cut everything. I was doing no ads, no advertising. And I was like, okay something is something's going to change wow. and where i was ready for it i felt like all those indie labels at the time were just kept spending until they ran out of money mm-hmm. so many record labels closed like the if you think about like the big heavyweights in in punk like the fact that lookout records closed mm. having operation ivy two green day records Screeching Weasel, A Veil, The Queers. I mean, just so many records. And for them right. to go under is insane. And the same could be for said for No Idea Records. Basically started a whole sound, the Gainesville sound. And yeah. the fact that No Idea Records is gone is insane to me too. Yeah, great point. So, 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 you, so you scaled back and you kind of um, doubled down with what you new could work did you um were there ever was there ever a period throughout the course of 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 your existence where um you ever thought about closing shop or or not no 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 the only time it's ever entered my mind is is there an end date like and the 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 answer to me it always comes back is is it not fun anymore and that'll be the end date. Yep. Right. So, 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 so the same way that you knew it was time to hang up, to hang it up, so to speak, with skank and pickle, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's 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 respectable. Um, what are some of the upcoming releases that you have um, uh, on on deck, so to speak, right now? So the Abrupters, the Buffalo Ska Rocksteady band. Yeah. Um, they have a full length coming out. I mean, we're just at the mercy of the vinyl manufacturers right now. Uh, the turnaround times are like up to Ridiculous, a year. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, we're hoping it gets out this year. I think we're going to release it regardless if we have the physical or not, because it's been so long. Um, but that's the next ska release. We have some like hardcore band. We have a hardcore band called Doki Doki. Uh, this indie pop band called Teens in Trouble. And... Uh, and then I have a I have a split release coming out with Catbite uh, on okay. Bad Time Records. Oh wow! Uh, two, two songs each. Uh, we haven't even announced it yet, so this will probably come out before it breaking, even gets announced. Breaking news here! You heard it here first. <laughs> That's super cool. That's exciting. Yeah. yeah, I do a I I do a song with Karina from Dancehall Crashers. Nice. Um, it's a really pretty like rock steady tune. I, oh, I think people good. people will dig it. So yeah, we, we, I'm we, excited. We, we, we spoke with Karina uh, a little little over a year ago, so that's great. That's great. Yeah. Um, well, you know what will help with the long lead time um, is for you to create a pressing plant. <laughs> I've thought about it, but it's so expensive. It's so, so, so going back, I'm going to bring this full circle. Going back to uh, if you have if you have a friend or or a, a relative. Who might be uh, on the racist side, but who is who is rich, <laughs> <laughs> and they pass and they have a big inheritance. That's where you take the money, and that's where you put it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I, I mean, yeah, the, the long turnaround times. I'm hearing mm-hmm. from from a lot of people is just 
it's horrible. It makes it really challenging. And so, so what's yeah, it, more frustrating? How about some of those pressing plants that closed? Um, are they too dilapidated, outdated to bring them back into production by modernizing them? Uh, I have that. I don't know. Yeah, a lot of them have just closed. There was a huge one in Southern California called Rainbow Records that has been yeah. around for 70 years. And their landlord wouldn't renew their lease. And they're like, well, we had a good 70 year run. They closed. And they were a big one. And that's who I was with. I had everything there crushing. Yeah, that was a big one. And that was a big, that was a big shame. Yeah. Um, Mike, what have we not touched on and talked about uh, during the course of this interview that that you do want to touch on? Um, any? Uh, actually, I have, I have another question before you answer that. Sorry. Yeah. Words of advice for for the uh, uh, the aspiring musician or aspiring uh, uh, the person who might want to start a ska band. Um, or any band for that matter, based on your on your years of wisdom? I think it's always about fun. Got to have fun. It's, it, I always feel like the bands who try too hard are like trying to make it. You can feel that. And it just doesn't come off genuine to me. Yeah, It's the bands who just don't care. They're just like, yeah, we'll play any show. We're just having, we're just having a good time. That's what it's about. If you can somehow... You know, obviously with a ska band a lot of times it's quite a few members yeah but if you can find a group of like five or six people who are all in and you really get along that's the magic recipe right there yeah getting along getting along is key <laughs> <What's that? laughs> getting yeah. along. definitely definitely yeah, key took um, the word out of my mouth. yeah um anything that we've not touched on that you that you that you like to share talk about nothing i can think of i just uh you know i appreciate you wanting to talk to me and i hope uh people listening learn something new <laughs> from me i feel like i repeat a lot of the old stories in a lot of the interviews i do so hopefully it was something that was uh new for people yeah well i i've, I've definitely enjoyed this junior anything that that we missed that no we for me for me all of this is new and i'm quite sure a lot of people out there it's new information valid information yeah new and valid mm -hmm. yeah and 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 big thanks to you i mean you've done so much for the scene both both as a musician you know a singer and performer but also just behind behind the scenes you know with asian man and and, and big big respect and big love to you for for everything i mean you you put your entire life uh you know behind behind uh, what you what you love and given a lot of joy i'm sure and a lot of memories to a lot of people out there so thank you thank you for all that you've done and continue to do mike Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. And for... it's been done with character and dignity. Those are important things. That is that is mm -hmm. true, and not and not and not all corporate greed. <laughs> not uh, it, it's it's been from a great place. So, um, you know that I think people know that, and that shows. So, Junior, thank you as well. Oh yes, sir. Mm -hmm. appreciate that. And Mike, where where uh, where is best for people to find you? This Asian Man Records is a uh, like Instagram dot com Asian Man Records or twitter asian slash asian man records and one of these days i'll play la again it's been i can't even remember how long it's been i think it's been close to 20 years now wow since really? i played well i since i played with the ska band yeah but uh i'd like to do a bruce lee band show in la one of these days that would be great you're really in your comfort zone <laughs> 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 so <laughs> So if I if I were to know people who are looking to have their records released, I uh, should I contact you? Have them contact you? Are you put are probably you... not? I don't. I I get so many submissions every day. I can imagine. Yeah. But there's so I, few labels around now. Yeah, I just usually say I try to write back to everybody, and I just say I'm just saying politely declining, but I because I wanted to give you the courtesy of writing back. Hey, and that's it. Well, at least, at least you respond. <laughs> that's how I feel like. Yeah, I want to at least respond and give. So, how do you decide then what to put out? Uh, it's a lot of word of mouth. It's like someone I respect will say, "Oh, well, you got to listen to this band." Mm, okay. I'll listen to it. and I'll be like, "Oh, that's horrible," oh. or 
Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. any, so it any, is any, a word of mouth. Any, any reggae in your label? I think the closest we is just like some dub stuff that some ska artists, artists will put out a dub track here and there, but nothing straight reggae. We've we've done some rock steady, but not just like traditional like roots reggae. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Excellent. All right, Junior. Mm -hmm. Or oh, where well, we need to start a label? <laughs> no. <laughs> It's a joke. We leave that, we leave <laughs> that for the professionals. It's a joke. <laughs> well, thanks again, Mike. Thank you. And wonderful, wonderful. Very knowledgeable. And you've done so many things in your life. <laughs> yeah, great, great conversation. My dear. goodness, wonderful. And you're taking a stand against injustice. That's really yeah. great. That's, I have to compliment you on that. That, that mm -hmm. too, absolutely. Mm -hmm. oh, I appreciate like, it. Yeah, and you know, people not pointing their fingers at you that you ripped them off. That's important too. <laughs> oh, yes, man. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So I guess we reach our destination. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yes, All we right. Have well, I uh, want to thank everyone for watching again. Thank you, Mike. Not to be repetitious. And please follow us at History of LA uh, on Instagram. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and join us uh, Facebook group. Eric, can you tell people where to find you? uh well i'm going to tell people where to follow you junior oh, at junior okay. francis mm. um and yes thank you everyone for uh the continued support of history mm. la ska so this series is brought to you by our producer here eric Holder, working like a firefly uh, extremely disciplined does this every day he has a new playlist up uh the playlist can be found. Uh, uh, you at, said, have at, you been doing the playlist? Yeah, yeah. Uh, myself and Sean. Even though you were on the vacation. Uh, <laughs> Just no, came back from vacation. Not as much, but somewhat. Yeah, not as much. Uh, All right. At, uh, mm -hmm. at rockery underscore radio. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Still doing it. Yes, sir. Yes, indeed, sir. Well, I think we've just about said everything. Thanks for everyone who will take the time to listen and watch us and continue to support. Yes. And until next time, mm -hmm. Mike, thank you very much. Junior, thank you as always. Mm -hmm. And thank you. To all of our listeners and viewers, appreciate that. Be well. Get out there and support live music, uh, support recorded music, and uh, much love and respect, everyone. Take care, Mike. Thank Dude. you. Bye-bye. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.